All right, good afternoon. I'm Rosalind Biggs. I am with the College of Veterinary Medicine as well as Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service with Oklahoma State University. We're really excited to have you here this afternoon uh, to kick off our Show Cattle Fundamentals series. Certainly recognize that with, with our audience here, many may be in school or also working too. And so we are recording today for, for playback. So if you have um, those in, in your circle that are interested in taking part, but maybe can't be with us today, we encourage them to take a look at beef.okstate.edu at the beginning of next week so that the recording can be viewed there. So Dr. Lawman, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Biggs. Um, my name is David Lawman, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist here at OSU Extension. Uh, I'm part of a statewide network. And as it says on our website, uh, OSU Extension helps Oklahoma solve local issues and concerns. Uh, I don't have it memorized, so I have to read it, but promote leadership and manage resources wisely. I can't think of a better description for what we're gonna be doing here through this series over the next, uh, this week and then three weeks following. Thanks for joining. Dr. Beck couldn't be with us today. He is uh, listening from his phone as he's off campus. Thanks, Dr. Lawman. Really excited for this, this series and, and privileged uh, to bring on board uh, for, for with ranchers, uh, two of our favorites here at OSU. And I'm gonna read their bios and then I'm gonna turn it over to them uh, to introduce our, our friends from OIE. First up is Rusty Gauze. Rusty serves Oklahoma State University as youth livestock specialist and, and is well known, of course, to our 4-H and FFA members across the state. His primary responsibilities, of course, are developing appropriate training programs and coordinate, coordinating youth activities. Rusty was born and raised in New Mexico and received his associate's degree from South Plains College, as well as his BS and master's in animal science from right here at Oklahoma State. Rusty received the Outstanding State Specialist Award from the Oklahoma, Ag excuse me, Oklahoma Association of Agricultural Extension Agents, the Distinguished Service Award from the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association, as well as the Honorary State FFA degree and Honorary American degree. He also serves as campus advisor for Cowboys for Christ and when not working with youth in his job, Rusty devotes his time to his family and his church. He and his wife, Heather, have eight children. Our other moderator today and, and speaker is Dr. Parker Henley. Dr. Henley is assistant professor and the livestock judging team coach. Uh, I think the judging team had a pretty good weekend uh, last, last week, as I recall, at Patriot. So uh, kudos to them. He, Dr. Henley received his master's and PhD from the University of Illinois, Illinois while focusing his research in nutrition and management strategies for heifer and bull development systems. Parker was raised in central Missouri, where he and his family still raise Angus and Charley cattle. He was a member of the judging team at Butler Community College, as well as Kansas State University, where he received his bachelor's in animal science. Currently, Dr. Henley teaches multiple undergraduate breeding and market animal evaluation courses, and he also serves as an extension specialist focused in beef cattle management and youth livestock selection and education in production systems. So, gentlemen, we're excited to have you on here with the ranchers and I will turn it over to you. Excellent, man. Thank you for having us. Um, we've uh, met for, for a couple of weeks now talking about this series and being excited about doing it. Um, so I think Parker and I both, um, I can speak for both of us in saying how uh, I think we feel a privilege to just be a part of the series and to really engage um, our state and beyond um, in the topic that we're gonna jump into for a couple of weeks. As we thought about who would we have on with us this kickoff um, session, I think two people came to mind that was just a no-brainer for us. Um, uh, two people that are both Oklahomans, um, two people that are extremely involved in the livestock industry um, and in the youth livestock industry, um, but also people that have families um, that are deeply involved um, in production agriculture, but also in youth livestock activities. And so we are very pleased to have uh, Tyler Ravel. Uh, Tyler is the Oklahoma Youth Expo president of Onward Endowment. Um, he's been um, serving and really leading the Oklahoma Youth Expo for um, a long time and really has recognized one of the most successful livestock venues really 
in the country, if not the, on the, the planet. Um, and Tyler is largely responsible for where it's at and what they're doing. Um, longtime OSU alum, uh, livestock judging member, um, but also um, maybe I'm most proud to call him a dad um, as his two daughters um, and wife um, really invest a lot of time as a family um, on a personal level, really showing livestock and being engaged that way. Uh, with him to his right, uh, our left is Cass Newell. Uh, Cass Newell serves as the Oklahoma Youth Expo Executive Vice President. Um, Cass, again, another longtime Oklahoman, um, grew up um, as a fifer um, with, with her family deeply involved in the Angus, um, Angus breed and um, market goats, um, just the, and the, the whole phenomenon that we've seen um, in Oklahoma with the, the goat industry. Um, they're, they're one of the key families that really have launched that um, to the successful um, species in Oklahoma and around the country that it is. Um, Cass, also a livestock team member here at OSU, um, involved in about everything. I can't think of very many things that I get to be involved with where Cass doesn't touch it somewhere. Um, she's an incredible uh, leader um, and extremely organized and really keeps the Oklahoma Youth Expo flowing. Um, so just privileged to have both of these on here uh, with us today. Um, and then you guys know Parker. Uh, Dr. Biggs did a great job of introducing him and, and I would echo uh, congratulations to Parker and his teams. They've just really taken the country by storm as they've started the judging season. And so good job there. Thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And like Rusty said, we were both very excited to uh, participate in this Rancher's Lunchtime Series and put a little different twist on it and uh, maybe bring a different group to uh, a great thing that our Extension Services has put out since COVID really struck. And uh, it's kind of hit the wall and, and stuck, I guess you could say. So we're pumped to be a part of it, and uh, as you guys know and have looked at it, it's titled the Show Cattle Fundamentals, but we have four uh, presentations over the next few weeks, and, and are all targeted at something a little different, and, um, you know, we're going to have a wide variety of audiences, and so we're going to try to make our content as, uh, as broad uh, as we possibly can, but hopefully uh, everyone here, no matter your age or what, can kind of take something home, and so this first one we're going to start with is titled The Keys to Show Ring Success. Um, and so uh, as Rusty did in introductions, no question, these two people that we're going to visit with and have our discussion know a lot about that uh, and I think can help you get in the right mindset for what we're going to talk about. One few house or a few housekeeping things, if uh, uh, you're watching, please go up in the upper right hand corner where the view is and, and change it to more of a gallery view because uh, it is going to be somewhat of a a round table discussion via Zoom, uh, I guess, as you can, you can imagine. And so we don't want the, the screen to be changing back and forth uh, so often. But like I said, we're going we're gonna to cover things. And, uh, you know, these, these talks are only, you know, 45 minutes to an hour long. And we don't expect anybody to become an expert in that time. But we definitely want you to feel comfortable enough uh, to, to ask us questions. You know, we have, we have great uh, extension agents that, that are focused in everything uh, in uh, the Cooperative Extension Services, uh, as well as show cattle stuff. And so we want to be your source for that information. Uh, we want you to feel very comfortable asking us the type of questions. And so, uh, Rusty, you want to kind of kick it off here and uh, get started. So. Yeah. Um, so how about um, we get Cass and Tyler here involved? Um, Cass, just how about you start with us? Um, why do you do so much and put so much effort into managing stock shows and putting these events on? What drives your passion for that? Well, growing up in the industry, I think, uh, you know, I got to uh, live that experience and have that outcome, have those networks, but also gain all those skills, uh, the work ethic that it instilled in me. I just feel like it's so important for youth around our state, around the nation, really, to have those experiences. And I think it's for us to you know, work really hard to put on a, an event for those kids to display uh, the work that they've put in all spring. And because you know they've worked their tail off, um, getting up early, staying out of the barn every night, and they've just learned so many skills that are irreplaceable that we know uh, from people that we've talked to, they're gonna take those to the workplace. And we're just basically developing better citizens for Oklahoma. Um, so I think I just, I'm very proud of that. 
growing up in the industry, you know, knowing what I got out of the program. And I want that same experience for other students as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I know we, we say the words life skills all the time. And I know we hang our hat on what the kids we know and families really get out of these programs or life skills, but uh, we probably just can't talk about it enough. I think sometimes there's so much attention to a lot of other things that are also good. Um, we lose sight sometimes of, of some of our core values and why we're doing this. But Absolutely. Tyler, and, yeah. uh, you know, as there's many different uh, roles of people on here, whether it's an ag advisor, an extension educator, uh, we, we a lot of times all have to have these discussions and convince parents or convince administrators um, about why we do what we do. And uh, I know uh, all four of us on here that uh, are very uh, understand that we have our, our discussion prepared to, and to convince everybody. But I encourage you, if you're going to have a, a show program or, or uh, you're going to lead kids, or maybe it's uh, yourself showing, understand why and be able to describe to somebody that's not in our industry why we do what we do. Uh, and just what Cass said there, we are making better, better young people and better Oklahomans uh, around the country. And so I, I know this kind of uh, stole a little bit of this, but it goes right into uh, Tyler. You do a, a ton of, um, are you, you're, you're just kind of a face for Oklahoma agriculture, I guess, and the show livestock industry. Um, what do you tell like the legislators and uh, other officials and, and people around the state as you promote OIE, Cattlemen's Congress and others? Yeah, you, you honestly don't have to tell them much because the program sells itself. You know, um, Justin Whitefield in 2002 or 2003 had the first ever legislative show at the Oklahoma Youth Expo and like seven members of the legislature showed up. And uh, this year or 2019 and this year we expect just as many, 100 of the 149 legislators showed up to show an animal with a kid from their district. And that's what I think has sold our program because they come out there and see firsthand what these young do. It's always a riot to see a grown man not able to handle 13, 1400 pound steer and there's a 10 year old kid standing next to him telling him what to do because he can. And uh, that, that gets them interested. And then they start asking questions and these kids can communicate. Uh, they're respectful, they've been raised right. And then they start to say, wow, my kids or grandkids or people I know need to be involved in this and evidenced by in Oklahoma, uh, leadership in the house, leadership, the governor's kids on livestock now because they've seen what it's done for the youth of Oklahoma and they want their kids to have that same experience. Another thing uh, we take for granted that I think more and more people are starting to understand because of this pandemic, but we teach these young people how to grow food and become more of an important issue that's risen to, risen to the top through the pandemic. It was the first time since maybe World War II people were worried about, am I going to have food to eat? Uh, if, if the pandemic shuts down all our processing facilities and transportation. And, uh, you know, McDonald's, our title sponsor, came to us for my time here. And, and they said, we want to get involved because the young people in your program are the ones that are going to grow the products that we sell at our stores. And without y'all, we have no future. And that, and I think that's something we take for granted that we're doing here because you think about your local extension offices, your local ag chapters, there's not as many traditional students involved in the programs. By that, I mean that their parents farm or ranch, not only full-time, farm or ranch part-time, you know, and a lot more. When my dad was a kid, almost everybody in FFA and 4-H were involved in production agriculture. So exposing a lot of young people to production agriculture and why the food supply is important through this program, even though uh, we do emphasize the leadership, potential job opportunities and life skills, which are the most important uh, because as uh, many politicians have said, we're investing in human capital as you all have alluded to. So, you know, it's not a hard program to sell because the kids sell it themselves. Great point. Tyler, I have a follow-up question there. And, and to back up, I think you and I have talked a lot about the, the OIE, for example, and other shows are really that carrot. That's the driving force, the motivation that really helps kids be motivated to work so hard. And the attention they get in that stage is so incredible that helps to motivate kids to, to work hard at four o'clock in the morning out in the cold barn. Um, but that trench work is, is part of what's so critical. What really is ends up making 
um, really the program what it is. But that end carrot is really valuable too. And would you maybe speak just a little bit of the impact of the Oklahoma Youth Expo to the state of Oklahoma? Yeah, yeah. It's twofold. One, let's just talk about economics and dollars. Um, just Oklahoma Youth Expo, you know, we're a $25 million economic impact on the city of Oklahoma City. And then you start thinking about all the money we send back to rural Oklahoma through our premium sale, through the guilt sale, through the youth sale, or excuse me, the dough sale, scholarships, the money that we invest. I mean, we're sending $250,000 to $300,000 a year to uh, higher learning institutions in the state, which I would guess about half of it goes to Oklahoma State, uh, as it should with agriculture kids. Um, and then you, you're not even talking about the money spent to purchase animals, to buy, to go to shows, to buy fuel. Um, our economic impact is, is a lot. Uh, we've never spent the money to get an official economic impact because they're not cheap. There's a lot of money that trades hands. And you know, there's something I want to add about the carrot at the end that you talked about, Rusty. You know, um, one thing uh, showing livestock does is it teaches you how to fail and it teaches you to learn from your failures. I was listening to a podcast a month or two ago and Ben Bobel was on it, who's judged our show. A lot of people will know Ben, a hog judge. And he said, the livestock industry has taught me how to fail because I fail far more than I succeed at this game at this industry, it teaches you how to get up. And I think kids today, I've learned it firsthand is they expect success every time or they, or they might give up a little quicker than we have in the past. And I think that's one thing that, that the livestock industry and show industry teaches us is, is how to lose and how to do it graciously uh, because it's gonna happen no matter who you are. And that's something our society could stand a little more of. And that's something, another thing I think we kind of take for granted as an industry. Absolutely. You know, I think uh, no question uh, if, if you're uh, an advisor, instructor, like being able to elaborate on these things and have these discussions like Tyler and Cass have stated are important, but let's take a step back and, and kind of get to know these guys. Cass, would you share with us just like your kind of earliest uh, memories and how your family, because uh, you guys are, uh, there's, there's a ton of you and you guys are all involved with uh, showing livestock for the most part. Can you kind of just give us a, a summary how you guys got started in the show ring? Yeah, so I'm a fifth generation agriculturalist. So um, my dad's grandparents parents live on the original homestead there um, and have continued that tradition. well known in the Angus cattle industry. My family well known in the industry. Uh, her dad started the black and white cell back whenever it first began. Um, and so we kind of have multiple facets of the industry there. Uh, and then whenever I was in, when we started kind of into the goats. And so that's kind of, you know, where they transition their folk. Um, so I guess for me, I was just born into it and I knew it was something that I wanted to do. And I think that the competitive spirit, you know, is kind of in our genetics, I would say, uh, because we're all very competitive. We all want to work to win. And I think that has helped me transition over into my role with the Oklahoma Youth Expo. Um, because, you know, I know what it takes to get to that point, but at the same time, I'm, I'm still very competitive. So I want to put on the very best show that we can for these exhibitors. And um, so I think, you know, it, it's ultimately just a thing for us. And I'm certainly grateful to be raised in the industry. Absolutely. For sure. And, uh, you know, relative to, to your family, Tyler, I, I know, uh, you have some young children, uh, but, for a family that's just begin showing you have had quite a bit of success. Uh, there's no question about it. And so I know there's probably some parents on here that uh, would like your perspective of, well, as a young show family, talk about some of those discussions you and your wife had about, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do it uh, this way. And, and who are the people that you guys uh, got yourself around or, or how did, how did you do that? And so, just talk a little bit to us about how you guys got started as a family. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, being involved in OYE and my oldest Madeline coming to the show ever since she was, you know, born and, and she had the passion to be involved and she was asking for it. And, and we wanted to start early so that when she did get old enough to show cattle, um, she had some ring presence. And so we started showing pigs. Um, because I think pigs are easy for a young kid to show, not easy, but the young kid's able to go out there and show them. And they can learn some ring presence and some savvy and um, 
to be alert in the show ring and learn the environment. We did that and we got whipped. We, we uh, were the definition of fail and uh, we learned and we tried to work hard, but we didn't know how to work. You know, uh, there's a difference between working hard and, and working efficient. And we didn't do that. And, and when we got ready to seek help, first of all, we said, we're going to have our ag teacher or extension agent involved. I think a lot of people say, well, ag teachers and extension agents aren't as involved as they used to be. And that's not their fault. That's the parents' fault. And we wanted our edu local educator involved in that process with us and involved them in it early. And then the next question was, as a parent, who can we go get to help us, not as much to win, but to make our children better children and to help us raise our kids in the right way? They had ethics, they had morals, and do it. The right way. That's that was a big question to us, and and uh, we've been able to surround ourselves with people to help us raise our kids and raise our family. That's the most important thing. Don't lie. There's times I may lose focus on that and get a little competitive, but those people that are around me that we have engaged help bring me back. And that's why I want them there. Um, I'll never forget it, Matt. The first time we uh, nominated Tulsa pigs for Madeline, that was the first show she could go to that had a premium auction. The night we nominated pigs, we had a cookout at our house for our veterinarian and people that helped us get there. And we had a nominating party as corny as that sounds. But I told my wife that night how lucky we are to have these people around us to help raise these kids, and they're still involved with us today. So as a parent, I would encourage you to keep your, and our ag educator was there, keep your educator with your extension agent or your ag teacher heavily involved in the process because even they're going to need help, but they'll bring things to the table that the person coaching you doesn't have. And so surround yourself with character people and uh, you will accomplish the ultimate goal of uh, raising uh, good children. And that's why we do this. I think the underlying point, I, I, I know that Tyler and I have talked about this a lot, even when he was really thinking about um, his girls showing, he and I had a lot of just one-on-one -on -one conversations about it. And one of the things that I knew Tyler cared about, and I think is one of those, if you're gonna, if you're gonna leave this webinar, this is one of the, the jewels that I think you ought to leave. It's identifying the measuring sticks of, of success for you and your family. <clears throat> and those are going to be different for different families, but those, those measuring sticks of success will help navigate. So it's not just that banner or the top slot in a premium sale at the end. That, and that, that can be a good measuring stick. That, that should be a piece of the puzzle to, to shoot for success and to do well. But, you know, Tom Brady's the only, only one that won a football game at the end of this year, right? He's not the only one that succeeded. And um, so, so to identify what things are you after as a family and what things are most important to you, I mean, you can have the greatest livestock project in the world and then they die. It just happens. It's real life. And so that can't just say, oh, that was a failure. No, we, what are we going to learn from that? And what did we do as a family? How did we relate to those others around us? Who we brought into this atmosphere that has made this adventure better. In the end, I, I really believe that this project is the best thing on the planet that brings parents and kids together to do an activity together. Um, there's lots of great youth activities out there, um, but you're, you're hard pressed to find something that puts mom, dad, kids in the barn together doing things elbow to elbow like youth projects do. So youth livestock projects do. So yeah. To, um, measuring success, just, just re recall that. Um, pass, with that, what do you see are some of the biggest mistakes maybe that you see families making as they kind of jump into this, this venture? I think that is a tough question, uh, but I do think that there are a lot of families that, you know, when they first start out, their only goal is to win. And yes, that should be one of your goals, <laughs> but I think that, you know, in all reality, like you just said, there's only one at the end of every show. There's only one grand in each species. Uh, and so I think that some of those families just starting out, they need to, you know, really think about, you know, what, what are we truly trying to achieve here? Are we trying to achieve grand? Yes, obviously, yes. But what are we truly trying to teach our kids and, you know, to get them, you know, the skills that they need to be successful? And I think, you know, going out and just, hitting it, you know, beginning and just trying to win. That should certainly be a, a great focus, but 
all, all of these families certainly need to recognize uh, that A, don't be afraid to ask for help. B, also take it in, you know, a full compass of things. There's so many things that going in, go into getting a show project ready. And to just, you know, take that slowly, take it all in. You have, you know, several years to exhibit at OIE or any of the shows. So, you know, take it in stride and, and just do your best and it's better for next year if you don't hit that grand champion prize the first year. Yep, absolutely. You know, I think uh, just to kind of recap some of that we discussed there, um, so many people think that uh, the only goal of success is, is to win a banner, to win something. And, and that's absolutely great to have. Uh, but you as parents that you may, if you're watching this, you probably uh, you have wide varieties of, of knowledge in this subject. Even if you have very little knowledge on uh, how to select a, a show steer that's gonna win or how to feed one, what you can do is, is say, okay, we're investing in this project uh, because we want to make our, our kids better. Well, uh, if you don't know which, you know, how to brush a calf right or what to feed it or anything like that, you can evaluate your kid's work ethic and you can provide critical feedback to them uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Because as a family, you may have that, uh, that coach or that extension educator or, or ag advisor that is going to come, you know, ever so often and give you feedback on your animal. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, your kids need to have feedback and they need to be pushed. And you, even if, like I said, if you don't have any knowledge in it, you can evaluate their work ethic uh, and, and be critical of it, good and bad. Uh, and that's really what it takes as a family. And it'll grow your family. Uh, and uh, so many of us can attest to that of how uh, if you're out there daily in the barn working together, uh, your family will grow. And that's ultimately one of the good things about it. And I know I alluded to it just a little bit there, but uh, relative to you as a parent investing in this project, those are hard conversations that, uh, that we have. And uh, Tyler, as a, as a show dad here, uh, has probably discussed that with his wife and, uh, and, and their family. But how do you guys decide how much money you want to dedicate toward this or how many resources you want to? Um, and uh, um, how, do you, how do you figure out uh, that kind of equation of this puzzle, Tyler? Yeah, no, that, that's a, a good question. And there's been a lot of discussion at our house about that because my wife, Beth, showed a lot of cattle growing up and uh, neither one of us had a lot of resources to spend on that, but yet it's got us where we are today. And so how do you walk that line of keeping your kid engaged and trying to be successful, but not, you know, spending too much revenue on it and putting your uh, budget at home in, a, in jeopardy. So, you know, we, we have worked hard to go out and try to find cattle that we can afford as a family that for a 10 year old little girl showing or gentle and one that she can handle and have fun with. And so, you know, there's times that we may be willing to spend a little more to get a gentle one as much as it is to get one that we think's better if he's mean and wild. So, you know, I think that's up to each family. Um, luckily, you know, there's good opportunities to grow and uh, show and learn at your county and, and recoup some of that money at your local premium sale. And you may say, well, we're gonna just spend X this year and try to make our county premium sale knowing OYE might be a little tougher. Um, you know, the market steer side of it is getting a little harder uh, to sell them and for people to buy them because they don't have the opportunity to return that they do in a breeding female. And that's why I think our breeding shows uh, across the board, not just in the cattle, continue to grow at OYE and our markets may go down just a little bit each year. Um, but you know, I encourage you, if, if money was a little tighter to go look and explore options to get a breeding heifer um, because you know you may be able to raise a steer or get a little more return on your investment quicker so um you have a good price you know when i was a kid you'd pay anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for a steer and people were given as much as ten thousand you know but i was more in that fifteen hundred dollar market and now you know your base price starts around twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred and literally goes as high as you want to pay so you know, I, I think there's a balance in there where you can go and buy a young skinny calf that's got a good future for that $3,500 to $5,000 range. Um, 
and then spending as much as you want from there on up. But it just kind of becomes the budgeting and learning. And I, I hope a lot of parents are still involving their young people and having a checking account and learning how to spend money and make money. And, you know, that's where I learned a lot of the basics. As odd as it's so I need to run our financials is I learned when I was nine years old and bought my first show cap. And uh, that's another thing we take for granted. And I would encourage parents to keep their kids heavily involved on the financial side of this thing. And so that they learn, hey, you can't spend money you don't have. And how do we make this thing cash flow and make it work for you the best we can? Um, because like I said, I got my first checking account when I was nine, and paid for my own feed with some help from my parents, but I wrote those checks. So I, I did still a lot of feed when I was a kid uh, and learned that the hard way. Absolutely. You know, I know relatively uh, speaking to selecting calves, I, I think too many people and families get so caught up in, well, how many did you sell before this calf? And uh, well, what's, where's this one at in the sale order? And well, if it's so far down, it's not going to be very good. And uh, do I have to buy the best or the most expensive one to win? And I'd encourage you to uh, be a steward of, of evaluation. You know, trust yourself. Uh, and, and what kind of animal you like. And then when you go find that animal, um, if you like one, buy it. It doesn't matter if it's the, the 25th one in the sale order. Uh, if it's in your budget, buy it. Don't let uh, uh, how many people have passed on that calf before you affect your decision, okay? And too many times we, people get influenced by things like that. Uh, trust yourself. Know what works in your family's barn uh, and land on it. And I, I think that's a big uh, thing that we can leave here uh, understanding in this kind of opening session is, is trust your ability, find something that works and, and commit to it. All right. That's a great point. <clears throat> I think um, it's probably important to remember that the, the show experience is not one year. Uh, there, there's a reason why when you see kids with a record book, they've been doing it since they were eight. Now they're 18 and they have a, it's really a 10 year program, a 10, 10 to 11 years, depending on how you want to, how you want to run it. <clears throat> and so you don't have to achieve everything within a six month period. I um, mean, it's, it's building blocks and you get to build on those blocks. Um, and hopefully by the end, um, then you really have a very diversified, well-rounded understanding of not just the livestock industry, but life skills that are developed. Um, relationships that are had and so so maybe sometimes take a step back away from the immediate and see what are the overall purposes of what we're doing and kind of keep that in mind I can recall my father and I grew up in a very diversified program um, if there was a barn with an animal in it we had one of them and it, all the way down to rabbits and chickens too we had it all if they had goldfish we would have done that we just didn't have a goldfish barn um, so we had uh, I remember my dad in my very first year kind of going over the big traits that we were looking for in this, this set of, it was, it was just a pen of calves. And, and then we drew, my sister and I, we drew numbers out of a hat and based on what we had really covered in livestock evaluation, um, I got first pick and I got to go pick. And and my dad really didn't overcorrect. He, he really let me own that decision, even though he knew at that time I picked extremely poorly. <laughs> I don't know what my parameters were, but it wasn't what my dad had taught me at the time. And, and I was going to learn from that decision through the whole process of the project. And then, and reviewing that, then I, I kind of understood. And then the next time that we built on those blocks to the point that he didn't even go with me anymore. I was selecting animals on my own and negotiating with buyers and negotiating with my sister <laughs> um, and, and how we did that project. And it just, I, I appreciate my father and our personal family really seeing that it was a 10 year process he was willing to invest really some failure early on because um, he knew that would be best in the long haul. And he was even trying to work himself out of a job in a sense to let me kind of own the project. So I think that's another key of, of just keep in mind it's, it's not the immediate. I realize there's a long, long program here. Um, Cass, you, you started when you were eight or younger. I, I can remember having feed delivered to your house when I was in a different role seeing you next to your dad and almost probably a, he didn't have car seat, but you were there about that age. And so you've been around this your whole life. Um, what are some nuggets of wisdom that you would give um, 
families that are trying to invest in this. And, and Tyler's right. We have more and more families that maybe don't have that rural background or that agricultural background. And I think our teachers and our educators are challenged with, man, how do we best help that family? We have a lot, an increasing number of those families that don't have the background. How do we help those families? What are keys to success that we can really help them? And how does that translate into what you see at the Hawaii? I would say, you know, one of the number one things that my parents taught us is that, you know, you win as a family, as a family. So it is a family sport. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I hear, you know, siblings and say, well, my brother won today, I'm mad at him, you know. That is not something that we were taught growing up. Like my brother, he had a hard time winning for whatever reason. He, he knew it was true. So his two younger sisters, we kind of beat up on him a bit. And he uh, he still worked just as hard in the barn with us. We all worked together in the barn. Um, and, you know, every time it, it didn't ever fail. We always tried and tried to get him the best effort. And he just couldn't quite pull through like my sister and I could. But that was one thing that, you know, my parents really instilled on us that that win, you know, whether it was any of the three of us, that was our family winning, not, it wasn't, it wasn't Chris, it wasn't Kelsey. You know, we win as a family, we work together as a family. Um, we're not going to separate, oh, I'm only going to, you know, wash my cattle. I'm only going to, you know, dry mine. You know, we all work together as a team. We all had our individual roles that we played. And I think that's really important with starting out that, it's important to teach your kids, you know, I would say from that aspect, it's about sharing and, you know, we learned to work on those things together. It made our, our bond closer than if it would have been individual, you know, this is mine, this is his, whatever. It made you work as a team and, and really develop those teamwork skills and, and just develop that good relationship with your family. Um, another thing I would say for families starting out is don't be afraid to build your network. Uh, because there are people out there who are willing to help you. And, and a lot of times it's simply just you need to ask for that help, whether it be your extension agent, like Tyler mentioned earlier, or someone else in the industry. Uh, I think it's important to, to reach out for that help, especially when you're just starting out and, and, you know, be willing to take that advice because none of us just started from scratch without asking for advice from someone. And um, we all, you know, throughout the time, it's a learning curve. Uh, trends change over time, products change over time. So it's constantly, you have to continue to learn every single year. I can promise you the products that they use now on cattle are not the same products that we would have used, you know, whenever we were years ago. Um, so I think it's important uh, for families just to, you know, take, like I said earlier, take it all in stride and, you know, Take it in little pieces and you're going to continue to build and grow over time as you work towards, you know, in every year of showing. And I say don't give up because it will be very beneficial for those exhibitors down the road. So Cass, uh, relative to that, I know this is specific. We have people here from multiple states, but uh, relative to OIE, um, and, you know, you talked a little bit about how families can maximize their experience there at OA, but tell us a little bit more about something that uh, maybe families should do or something a lot of people don't know uh, about OIE that they should participate in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little on that and I'll open up for Tyler too because he'll probably have something to want to add. I think, you know, coming into OIE just we stall by a club and stuff. So I think it's important that as a family, uh, you get along well with all the other families in your club. That's always an issue that we can have every year. So I think it's important to build those relationships on the local level, but then beyond that, you know, let your kids go out and meet other kids their age because they're going to build those bonds. My best friends today are that I grew up showing with. So I think it's important for families to, to give those kids those experiences but then beyond that, I think it's also important to take advantage of other events that we have, like going on during OIE, like the Skillathon. And that's a, it's an individual component of OIE. You don't actually have to show livestock at OIE to compete in it, but it's one that just tests those students' knowledge of the agriculture industry. And it's a great way for students to um, get scholarship money that they can use, you know, whenever they get to college. And I think it's very beneficial um, to, to participate in events like that just become as involved as possible. I know there's a limit 
because a lot of times, you know, you can only take so many days off work or whatever that may be. But, you know, try to be as involved as you can as a family uh, and then get to know those other, you know, stalling neighbors that you may have because they could eventually be your best friends down the road. Tyler, you want to add anything on to that? No, the only thing I would add is this year, you know, come prepared to follow the guidelines so we can can have this show and so that we can finish it out and not have the disappointment of last year. I mean, we've worked great with the city and the state on Cattlemen's Congress, and we know the path to uh, completing this show, but we've got to do our part. A mask is a small thing to ask for these kids. And uh, so no matter what your thoughts are on wearing a mask or not, we're not here to debate that. We're here to give these kids off the they've worked all year for. And, um, you know, when we're in the kids' show, they'll have masks on. Uh, when you're in the State Fair Arena or up watching the shows, we're going to ask you masks. Now, if you're back in the barns with your clubs and around people, you're around all that's your choice to wear a mask there. But when you come to the show ring, be prepared to put one on. And, um, you know, we'll get through it. We're looking forward to a very successful show, but that's what we're about this year. We need to come with the right mindset. Absolutely. And relative, you know, kind of on the same topic, but changing a little bit. If uh, we have some people on here that have, uh, you know, show heifer or show steer, what's some last minute or things they need to be doing? We're 30 days out roughly uh, from the show. What are some things or keys right now that you think a family should be kind of focusing on? For the next seven days, keeping them alive, not frozen. <laughs> so, uh, Absolutely. But, but but no, I mean, from my perspective, and she can get into the entries and preparing, but she already hit it, you know, talking to your local advisor that may be uh, and other exhibitors about how we're going to stall and getting our equipment in and who's going to have what area once the stalling comes out and entries. I believe we just lost Tyler. He was going to say something so powerful, too. Yeah. Well, well, while we wait, while we wait uh, for for them to rejoin us, why don't we encourage our attendees to put any questions they may have in in the chat or or the Q and A feature? And um, gentlemen, if you want to to watch that, uh, I will I will step away and make sure we get them connected back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, uh, feel free to just share the questions on here. We, we'd love to ask them. And if there's something about a future topic, we can address it in the next week or so. Um, but we're, we're, we're kind of coming down to the end here and me and Rusty can definitely uh, discuss and talk uh, to some of these points. It sounds like they're getting logged back on here. Um, but right now is make sure you don't cut corners on getting ready for the show all right and whether you have a show calf you know maybe some days you go out and you just practice for five minutes and you set up one time and, and you take them back and, and put them in the barn all right i think it's important that you get some stamina built up not only in your animal uh, but also in the showman itself uh, when you're in that tough class at oie and there's uh, quite a few steers and you may be in there for uh, 20 or 30 minutes, uh, you could really wear down. And when it's close and it's challenging at the end, uh, being prepared uh, and being able to present your animal for that length of time can be all the difference. And so uh, these last 30 days, like I said, there's not, you know, you're not going to change the, the structure of your calf. You're, you know, the, you're not going to grow much more hair. You're just going to need to hold it. But what you can do is make sure your kid or your calf is prepared uh, uh, for the long term, okay, in the show ring. Rusty, you got any comments relative to that? Yeah, so as we, some of the things that I think maybe don't get as much attention because they're just frankly not quite as fun, um, but as we approach really these shows, and, and many of you who are either have families that are, are showing or maybe are showing yourself, really are probably hitting local shows, county shows, and district shows leading up to the o Oklahoma Youth Expo uh, at this time of year. And so things like biosecurity measures and um, paying attention to um, what products you may be using that may be cloning close to like a withdrawal time. Th those issues um, are really significant and they're a significant part of how we manage these projects. And through the, through the back 
six months to a year, maybe they haven't mattered quite as much. You either haven't been traveling or you haven't been close to a, really a terminal deadline. Um, so really boning up on those details, um, we, we've seen it every year where there's a slip up on one of those issues can really derail an investment of a year into the project or six months into the project. Um, and so no, no need to do that. And, and those are guidelines that are really important. We're gonna actually, for those of you kind of tuning in, wanting maybe some specific guidelines and instruction, um, those are topics that we're gonna be planning on hitting in the series to come. Yeah. Um, very specifically, so those details are found. But, but as we talk overarching, as we approach the final final stretch here, those are some things that really you should spend a little time on and knowing how to, how to best protect um, not just your operation, but the others in the state. Absolutely, Rusty. And uh, so I know how we're, we're getting close here to, to the end, but we saved the last thing uh, to discuss here is uh, a little bit of, I guess you'd call it a state of the union, I guess, uh, from Tyler here relative to uh, OIE um, and, and other OIE managed shows. Just what, what's your expectations going forward? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, the pandemic, if you asked me a year ago right now, or even when OIE was canceled, what would the next year would look like? I'd never guess I'd be sitting here today telling you we put on three alternative shows and uh, one of them that's going to be a new tradition for the cattle industry for many years to come. Um, you know, our plan is to continue to stay involved with the show in California. Uh, we hope the state fair will have their event again this year and we'll just, you know, the EYO will be the state fair show. And then uh, we're planning on having Cattlemen's Congress next year. Uh, we've been working with the different breed associations uh, to see what their plans are, and they'll be voting on those decisions in the next couple of months. Uh, we recently, uh, this isn't really public yet, but we recently named Bray Haven, who works here with us, as the Executive Vice President of Cattlemen's Congress, just like Cass is with OYE. He'll have that role with Cattlemen's Congress. So we're excited to have Bray in that role. Uh, but, but It's public now. It's public now, and I, I was just holding it for this to announce it. Uh, and, and we've been meaning to get a press release out on it, but people know, and uh, Bray will continue to help with OYE, just like Cass will help in a role with Cattlemen's Congress. But, um, but we're committed to the Cattlemen's Congress long term. We know how important it is for the beef industry, how great it is for our state, and we know it won't take away from our jobs and what we can do for OYE. So we're just looking for more opportunities to help young people and help the industry as a whole. Um, sponsorships have been really strong. Our premium sales should be really strong like it has been in the past. And uh, we just look forward to the future and everybody getting here in about five or six weeks. Dr. Biggs, I have a question here and, and I'm gonna go ahead and ask it and maybe preface maybe the answer before we answer it. But uh, so um, says, hello, I'm a 4-H goat shower and is wanting to do cattle as well. What are your recommendations on who to buy cattle from? And in parentheses, put a, I prefer a budget of $1,000 or less. And so we're probably not in a position within this panel to actually give specific names of buyers to go see. Um, but I think we can give guidance maybe on how to then go about getting those names. So uh, I don't know, Tyler, Cass, Parker, you yeah. can all, we're going to give some guidance here. Yeah, uh, no, go ahead. Well, I would reach out to your local, if you're in 4-H club, your extension agent or your local ag educator and see if there's any ranchers in your area or your community that might be willing to help you out with that budget. And, and I would encourage you to try and go find a heifer to start off with uh, because you'll have an opportunity to grow your herd. And, uh, you know, a, a rancher may be willing to give you a, a good deal for a local 4-H or FFA kid. And so, you know, that's what I did when I got started with a with very similar budget is went to a neighbor. Uh, who helped me out and, and got me started. So that, that would be my recommendation. Sure. We got some other questions coming in here relative to uh, some nutritional standpoints. Uh, boy, the weather is going to be crazy. And if you know much about beef cattle, uh, it, when, when the weather is bad, uh, routines are important. Um, it causes stress and it causes weird behaviors from cattle. And so uh, make sure you, you know, you're feeding them twice a day. You have uh, an ample amount of forage available to them, free choice hay, because uh, changes in weather really, really mess with uh, any kind of cattle. And so keep a routine, uh, keep some hay in front of them, make sure they got uh, clean and uh, um, available water that's not frozen. And on that topic, 
uh, we're going to have a, a great discussion next week that really targets that. Um, some nutritional questions you may have, some things you need to be doing leading into the spring shows uh, and other things. But more pertinent, and just keep them alive. As Tyler said, uh, this weather is going to be rough. Rusty? Yeah, we're getting some great specific questions here. Here's a uh, from a Teresa. I have a heifer that keeps rubbing the hay feeder. She is rubbing the hair off in spots really bad. We have medicated for lice. What other things do you recommend for hair regrowth and to keep her from doing this? Yeah, that's happened at my house. Um, one, if you have a bell feeder, we went and got some that have uh, that are that are poly, you know, where it's hard for them to rub and they're a little smoother. Um, and she may have that one. The other deal is um, we like to use prolate quite a bit and give them prolate baths and let it sit for about two minutes. Um, and that has traditionally helped us keep from rubbing. And then when we're not doing prolate, we'll use some type of conditioner uh, to kind of let that sink down to try to get that skin from keep that skin from being as dry. So prolate bath, uh, conditioner, and then your best bet between now and then to make it grow back is just brush and freeze water and put frozen water on there and it should come back slowly. But the more you moisturize that skin where she rubbed it off, the more likely it'll come back quicker and she'll quit rubbing. But that's happened to all of us. That's why every square inch of my house is covered in hot wire right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a, have a question here just about future opportunities. And I think yeah, this is a great question. I think you have some other judging opportunities and show experience um, this summer, um, right? And so, yeah, we do. And I think as we see COVID, I mean, no one really knows at this point what, what the next six months is going to look like. Um, but I think there's optimism for sure um, that um, a lot of different pieces in life are going to start to look a little more normal with the vaccine that is really getting more widespread, with our knowledge of it, with warmer temperatures, um, and just with our understanding of better how to maybe manage some of the events that we have traditionally had and how to do it in a safe way. Um, judging contests, for example, I think Parker and I have really learned um, through our, the last year of how to, how to conduct a livestock judging competition with COVID in mind and how to do it in a safe way where teams are safe, um, where the, the officials are safe, where the livestock is safe. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think there's more and more opportunities, even if nothing changes for us to be able to really engage back in the, the educational activities that we really count on doing every year. So yes, I think there's optimism on going forward. <laughs> Are you reading these questions? Um, <laughs> you get the next one. Yeah. Uh, you know, just uh, one person asked here about uh, routine with your animals. Uh, we definitely do recommend you to, you know, to spend time with them a couple times a day, feed them twice a day, uh, and, and just be around them and, and uh, um, multiple times and check on them, okay? Uh, again, we'll talk a little more about that next week, and so – uh, Aiden, that'd be a, a good uh, question that we'll cover more next time. Uh, you know, uh, Parker, we have, we have a question here. I, I can kind of maybe rephrase this correctly, but so really it's a question on um, really phenotype of the animal and um, recognizing that the judges, yes, there, there, are, there are traits, there are key traits that judges are looking for compared to an industry standard. And that's really what they're gauging the evaluation of every animal individually. And so things like muscle thickness in goats, for example, uh, is one of the things that we'd be looking for. And so I think the question is really asking, you know, I know that we need to have your muscle goats. How do I help get my goat to be heavier muscled? I think there's, there's some genetic reasons that we can really look at, some environmental reasons we can look at with how they grow and what we feed them. So Cash, you might be able to talk about that more than anyone with just some overall advice of of that, but I think that's what the question is probably asking. Yeah, so I would say, uh, and, you know, probably the most important thing in getting a goat uh, prepared for the show to, you know, to get that heavy muscle that they need would be to put them on a proper uh, diet. And so you would need to talk to um, your extension agent or ag teacher or someone in the industry to specifically, you know, every goat's different on what they exactly need. Uh, so, but it's important to have, you know, that high quality show feed. 
that's going to help them tone up that muscle shape. But then again, also, you know, Rusty talked about environment. Uh, a lot of people exercise their goats and that helps to build up a lot of muscle as well. Um, so I think that's also important. There's several ways to do that, whether it be running them down the road or treadmilling them, uh, multiple different ways of doing that. Uh, you're definitely going to want to know exactly how to do that rather than just jumping in and, you know, putting them on there without any guidance. Uh, but those are some, definitely some areas that could help build that muscle shape and tone them up. Great. No, that's not to move on, but there's another really good question that came in here relative to, um, how do you have livestock judging contests and uh, events right now um, with all the things happening? And, and um, so relative to livestock judging contests, I think the big thing you can do is plan and be prepared. Uh, we would be happy to share some of the stuff that we have done. Uh, early on in this, Rusty and I developed some guidelines or considerations uh, for hosting livestock judging events uh, during COVID-19. Um, and we have that document prepared uh, and published, and we would love to share that with anybody if you want to just shoot us an email. Um, and, and it has things relative to uh, having hand sanitizers placed in the proper position, how do you stage reasons, how, uh, you know, things you'd need uh, in the reasons room. Um, and uh, we here in Oklahoma, uh, it, has, it has been approved and we've had great success at, uh, at hosting events like that. Now, I don't know about other states and other places and different administrations, uh, but definitely here with uh, these, these guidelines in place, uh, we've got some approval and it's been very, very successful at doing it. Rusty? Yeah, it's at all those events, whether it's a livestock show or a judging contest, it's really a lot of it's just how do you manage a crowd safely and so most of the guidelines are all in regard to how do we how do we do this as a group and yet recognize that there are situations where we have to have space where we have to have um, you know safety equipment where we have to have hand sanitizers um, all of that um, that's kind of in play so lots of resources out there and we definitely would be able to send you some of those That, that might kind of conclude our questions that we have in front of us, Dr. Biggs. Yes, sir. I think, I think we've got all the answers um, taken care of as far as those that have been, have been submitted. Uh, Dr. Henley, I put your email address for, for our one participant that was wanting those guidelines so they can, they can email you there. I definitely want to thank everyone that's participated today. Uh, we've, we've got participants really from, from multiple states. We'll hope you'll, you'll join us next week as, as well as we talk a little bit more about nutrition of, uh, uh, of show animals, as well as from a show, show perspective, how we manage that residue avoidance issue when we're looking to, to medicate and, and otherwise cannot leave, uh, leave today without thanking Tyler and Kaz for joining us. Uh, we certainly want to thank them for their, their time and continued commitment to the shows that are hosted here in Oklahoma. Uh, for those of all, you all that may have missed it, they were recently, Tyler himself was voted the industry leader of the year by the Pulse. And, and so that's certainly an, an accolade uh, to be proud of. And um, Kaz was recently recognized as one of the amazing Oklahomans by one of our, our news stations. And so uh, we, again, can't thank them enough. Um, I, I also wanna thank Rusty and Parker for, for being with us. I'm a product of the Oklahoma 4-H and FFA program. Uh, Tyler and I are actually from the, the same county. And so um, very, very humble beginnings there for me. And, uh, but it certainly played a large part in success for me and my family. And um, so thank everyone for, for joining today. Uh, look to, to seeing all of our participants hopefully next week. If again, if you are looking to see a recording, want to share that uh, as a, an ag educator, then we certainly want to direct you to that beef.okstate.edu. We've got a lot of uh, resources there uh, for, for participants, and we will have this recording there probably by the beginning of next week. So we'll see you next week. Again, Tyler, Kaz, thanks so much. 
um, please thank the rest of the OYE team. We know you're you're really, really busy uh, with a variety of things uh, and you'd, you'd really just amp it up a notch each year uh, looking forward to March here. So thanks thank again. You.